Hello Life Changers and what a privilege to be with you today. Whether you are watching from home, you're in your PJs, maybe you cuddled on the couch, but maybe you are in a hospital room or separated from those you love. We just want you to know that we pray somewhere in this broadcast, you will know that you are loved, seen and that God has a plan for your life. Hey, I want to honor your pastors, Mark and Candice. We love you guys. What a joy to have leaders who are so amazing, who love God, love His church, and are leading you guys in a whole different reality. So we are rooting for you. Stay together, stay connected, lean in, and happy Mother's Day to all the mummies, the grandmummies, the spiritual mummies, those who feed our bellies and um, encourage us and support our dreams. We know that for some of you, this is a tough day. So uh, we are mindful of that. Uh, but let's dig into this message today. I love that you guys are talking about Hebrews, our faith heroes in Hebrews 11. And um, really, it is a letter uh, encouraging, being written to a group of people to encourage them uh, in, in their faith as they were being persecuted. Um, I, wa I want to just say something, uh, you know, my mom uh, passed away in 2002 and she died really suddenly in, um, you know, it, it, she was 67. She was my greatest friend, cheerleader, encourager of my faith. She was fierce. And in, at one point in my life, I remember I was about 18 years old. I was a prodigal daughter. I had run away from home. And my dad would tell the story that she would go out into the balcony at night and cry out into the dark, Marlies, come home in the name of Jesus. And the neighbors thought she was crazy. Um, but here, here's the thing. She had perspective. She had spiritual sight. And she saw something by faith that not even my dad could see. So I think a mom out there needs to be reminded that prayer works. Um, but I, what I really want to point out is uh, the people who could see, people who are ordinary, like you and me, my mom, and the people in Hebrews 11. It actually says in verse 3, uh, they could, by faith, conquer kingdoms, enforce justice. They obtained promises and they even stopped the mouths of lions. And so I like to say that by faith, my mom's prayers called me back to the heart of God. Crazy thing, what ordinary people can do with faith. Uh, I believe that their faith wasn't rooted in circumstances. And what they had in common was eyes to see beyond what was just in front of them. So today's message is entitled, What Do You See? There is a story in the Bible where God asks somebody that specific question. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible about perspective. I want to drop you into the story. It's in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 24. It's around 600 to 700 years before Christ, and it's a traumatic time for Israel, for the people of God, because they are being crushed by their enemies, the Assyrians. And we read that 10 tribes of Israel were exiled, and all that was left was the kingdom of Judah. And this is where we find Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, in the middle of all this mess, in the middle of being conquered, in the middle of the temple being destroyed, in the middle of all his people be com being completely displaced, in the middle of adversity. Can you relate? Have you ever felt you in, this, in, in the middle of something where those um, you love are displaced or things you've worked for has been destroyed? Well, you're in good company because God can speak to you there. That is exactly where he spoke to Jeremiah. In chapter 24, verse 1, we read that the day came when King Nebuchadnezzar took king of Judah into exile along with the prince of Judah. And it talks about all the artisans. He took everyone, the skilled laborers, not just the noble people. Everybody was exiled. And sometime after they arrived in Babylon, the Eternal showed um, Jeremiah a vision. It says, I looked and I saw two baskets of figs 
placed in front of the temple. One basket was filled with good figs and the other basket was filled with very bad figs. In fact, they were too bad to be eaten. Now, you should know the prevailing thought in Jerusalem around this time was that those who were not displaced or exiled, that they had avoided God's judgment. They were the special one. Almost like when you imagine you your mom's favorite, but she tells everybody else behind your back that they are their favorites too. But how horrible those people must have felt. Like, oh, we are the special ones and you are the exiled ones. But then we read that their short-sighted perspective is corrected by this vision that Jeremiah has. And God says to Jeremiah in verse 3, these very four important words, What do you see? Can you say that with me? What do you see? And Jeremiah responds in verse 3, this is what he says, I see figs, both good and bad. The good ones are very good, but the bad ones are so rotten, they cannot be eaten. And then in verse 5, at this, the word of the eternal, the God of Israel says, these good figs are like those who have been taken into exile from Judah. And even though they are in captivity, listen to what God is saying to Jeremiah. I will watch over them. I will look out for their good. And one day I will bring them home. Then I will rebuild them and not tear them down. I will plant them anew and not uproot them. I will give them a new intense desire to know me because I am the eternal one. They will be my people and I will be their God. Isn't that a crazy story? Jeremiah must have thought, what? Do you mean those who were taken into captivity? Those were the good figs? And here is Jeremiah with God. And God is literally literally downloading him and speaking to him about the people that God loves. We are those people, you and I. Now, I'm thinking about all those faith heroes in Hebrews 11. Do you think they would be considered good figs? I think they would. Like, do you feel, do you ever feel that way? They must have felt discouraged. Do you feel that way? Do you feel unloved? Maybe that God is distant, that distant, that he doesn't care, that he's unaware of your situation, your fears, your challenges. Maybe you are facing a giant today. Maybe it's a giant of infertility or loss or betrayal or grief. Uh, Maybe you feel that God didn't take care of something that came to harm you. Let me ask you what God asked Jeremiah. What do you see? Now, here's the thing. Perspective is interesting. And by interesting, I mean a little bit fickle. Because as humans, our perspective is, is so shaped by our experiences I think seeing with God's perspective is going to be an ongoing challenge for us. But here's the deal. I haven't always worn glasses. At some point about a year ago, I realized, man, I I just can't read anymore. And then I'd say, oh, everything seems so blurry. And my husband would say, your lenses are dirty, especially after I had just passionately, which I do often, I love potato chips. And somehow I just get, get the oil all over my lenses. But the problem really isn't what I'm looking at. The problem is my lens. And so the Bible really uh, explains this so well because it says in 1 Corinthians, we don't yet see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But then what I love about the Apostle Paul, he prays for people like me who can't see. And he says, I pray that your eyes will be focused and clear so that you can see what he's calling you to. Ephesians 1, 18. Let me share three lenses that I am processing in my life. Lenses that are helping me see better. One of my lenses about faith is this. Are you writing this down if you've got a pen? Number one, faith isn't blind. That's just the truth. Like a blind leap into the dark isn't really faith because faith isn't based on just believing Jesus died or God is good. Faith at its root is a deep trust and a 
confidence in the person of who God is so much that we build our entire lives around it. We can have faith based on the knowledge of God's nature and his character. Are you ready for lens number two about faith? Faith isn't denial. There is no virtue in denial. Nothing is holy about denying the obvious in the name of faith. Faith, you see, doesn't always take you out of the problem, but it takes you through the problem. Just like David said, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? It doesn't always take away the pain, but it gives you the ability to endure the pain. It doesn't take you out of the storm, but it calms you in the storm. Now, here is the third lens. Faith isn't based on our feelings. Oh, Mufasa, that is a tough one for me because I am a feeler. I feel all the feels and I think it's okay to feel all our feels. Feelings and emotions are essential. In fact, they are God-created aspects of life because they enable us to experience Him, gives us the ability to experience others. I think by not feeling our emotions, uh, we lose a wonderful opportunity to connect with God. But here's the caveat. If we are not careful, our feelings and our perspectives can end up being driven by what we've experienced and not necessarily what is true or what is godly or what is faith. So there is a place for emotions and there's a place for feelings. But here's the thing. Faith extends beyond what we learn from our senses. There are things that will transcend our feelings. Faith, listen, faith will call us to believe even when we don't see. So back to our faith heroes and the prophet Jeremiah. So if you find yourself facing a giant, feeling like everything has been destroyed, if you find um, yourself displaced or the things you love have been given away or lost, I want to encourage you today to ask with the eyes of faith, what do you see? Because I believe God was showing Jeremiah four things in that scripture we read. Jeremiah 24, 6. Even though they are in captivity, I will watch over them. I will look out for their good. I will bring them home. I will rebuild them. I will not tear them down. I will plant them anew and I will not uproot them and I will give them a new intense desire for me. Isn't that incredible? These four promises that God gave them, that God is giving us today. Here they are real quickly. Number one, safety. Even though they were in captivity, God says, I will watch over them. And I love what Psalm 1991 says to us. You who sit down in the high God's prison, spend the night in his shadow. Say, God, you my refuge. I trust in you and I'm safe. I love Psalm 91. Here's the second promise that God makes to Jeremiah and those who are exiled. Redemption. He says, I will look out for the good and one day I will bring them home. I will rebuild them. I will not tear them down. I love that promise that God never wastes pain. Romans 8.28 says, we know the scripture well, God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. Two more promises, okay? Number three, growth. God promises growth. He says, I will plant them anew. And God in some way in this season where you find yourself is going to grow you. Your roots are going to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. And sometimes you won't see the growth. Sometimes you won't see the fruit. But if you know God and if you have eyes to see, I promise you, you are growing. He might be growing your roots and not your fruits. But he has the wonderful part. Roots are what sustains you in a storm, not fruits. Psalm 1 verse 3 says, The man or the woman who trusts God is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf doesn't wither. Here's the final promise that God makes in Jeremiah. He promises them identity. God says to Jeremiah, I will give them an intense desire for me because I am the eternal one. 
They will be my people and I will be their God because they will return to me completely. I just want you to know that our identity is being a son and a daughter of God. It's found in whose we are, not who we are. And the truth is that often our identity is built in the tough seasons. I want to read this final scripture to you, Romans 8 verse 37 to 39. So what do you think with God on our side like this? How can we lose if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his son? Is there anything he wouldn't do for us? So life changes in closing. God has a plan for your life. And that plan is currently being incubated in a world that is broken, in a world where bad things happen to good people. But God is a covenant God. He doesn't have commitment issues and he can use all these situations to draw us back to him. He can take what is bad and use it for good. And there's a whole cloud of witnesses cheering us on. So let me ask you this, what do you see? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are a God who sees us. You see us wherever we find ourselves today. Thank you that we can find shelter under your wings. Thank you that you cause all things to work out for the good of those who love you. Thank you that you call those close who might feel far away today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you do what only you can do. I thank you that even this word, this encouragement, that it will bear fruit and that it would achieve exactly what you intended to. We thank you for the way you father us. And we thank you that you bless every mum and every heart under the sound of my voice. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.